Hard Talk. You're listening to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Video segments of today's program will be posted at AFR.net and on the Focal Point Facebook page. You'll also find the best collection of Brian's resources on our Facebook page. If you're on Twitter, you can be among the first every morning to find out what the day's show will be about. Just follow Brian at Brian J. At Fisher. Brian J. Fisher. Hi, and welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. Uh, uh, number to call, 888-589-8840, if you would like to join the program, 888-589-8840. You know, I've suggested that it is a mistake for us to allow Muslims to serve in the United States military. Not because I think all Muslims are bad people, not because I think even most Muslims are bad people. I'm not saying that. But the problem is we don't know which Muslims we have to worry about. We have no way to identify the ones that we have to worry about and distinguish them for the ones we don't have to worry about. Uh, and, and that's why I think we just should not take the chance. You know, the purpose of our military is not to be diverse and and celebrate the wonders of multiculturalism. The purpose of the military is to protect the sovereignty and the freedom and the liberty of the American people. We cannot be afforded. We cannot afford to take politically correct chances with our national security. And realize there is no constitutional right to serve in the United States military. Congress has given the authority in our Constitution to set whatever rules they want for military service. That's their prerogative, according to Article One, Section Eight. So if the Congress decides that there will be no Muslims in the military, they can do that. It's within their constitutional prerogative to do it. It wouldn't violate any part of the Constitution. It would, they would be acting consistent with their constitutional authority. And so why do I say that we should not have Muslims in our military? It's because you, you are inviting people into your military whose God, whose prophet, whose religion, whose holy book teaches them to kill us. They've got a God, they've got a prophet, they've got a holy book, they've got a religion that teaches them that we are the enemy, that the other members of our military are their enemy. I mean, that's why uh, Major Nadal Hassan shot up Fort Hood, because he said, look, I am a Muslim first and I am an American second, and I'm not going to go and, and take up arms against my Muslim brothers in Afghanistan. And rather than do that... He took out a whole bunch of infidels at, at Fort Hood because that's what his religion, that's what his God, that's what his holy book, that's what his prophet teaches him to do. Now, do I say all Muslims in the military believe that, think that way? No, I'm not saying that. But the problem is how do we, how do we identify the ones that represent this kind of a threat and what do we do about them? That's the problem. We just never know which one of these is a ticking time bomb, is going to develop sudden jihad syndrome, is going to become... Uh, almost without warning, increasingly devout in his Islamic faith and start taking the verses in the Quran seriously that tell him literally to cut the heads off of infidels. We don't know when that's going to happen. And I mentioned this story at the end of the last segment, but it's about a 20-year-old California student, outgoing National Guard member. This guy's a member of the United States military. He was arrested and charged with supporting a terrorist group after allegedly planning to join Islamic extremists in Syria. So they got him going across the border. Nicholas Toussaint of Ocampo, Florida, who prosecutors said had also spoken of a desire to bomb the Los Angeles subway system. They actually planned to go on a camping trip where they were going to plot blowing up the Los Angeles subway system, but they got tipped off that the authorities were onto them, so they didn't do it, and that was slated. They wanted to do that on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day of 2013, last day of 2013, first day of 2014. So now he wanted to go join the Al-Qaeda-affiliated group, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant in Syria. So he wanted to go and fight with his new Muslim brothers in the faith in Syria and, and learn everything about jihad. Now remember, Syria has become basically a, 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 a slaughterhouse for Christians at the hands of the people this guy wants to go fight with. They've got snipers picking Christians off. They're burning their homes. They're, they're burning their villages. They're burning their churches. They're driving them completely out of the country of Syria altogether. And this guy wants to go over 
and fight alongside the people that are doing that to our brothers and sisters in our uh, common faith. Uh, last spring, Toussaint began expressing a desire to see America's downfall, writing on a social media account, quote, I would love to join Allah's army, but I don't even know how to start. Now, I don't know when the authorities tumbled to this, when they were aware he was putting this kind of stuff up on social media sites, but he was part of the National Guard when he was doing this. He was part of the military, and nothing was done. Nothing was done uh, to deal with this issue. He continued to be a part of the National Guard. He described himself as a convert to Islam, a development also noted by fellow students who know him. You look at his name. It's not a, an Arab name, Nicholas Toussaint. That's about as, well, I guess it's French or something. I don't know. But that's about as American as you're going to be able to get. So you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at his name that this guy wanted to blow up the Los Angeles subway system with as many people on trains as he possibly could. Uh, and so he's a convert. So the danger now is not just from immigrants. We've got a homegrown danger now. People that are being, uh, are being radicalized right here in the United States, starting off as American citizens and becoming radical proponents of jihad and ready to go carry it out on the field. He posted a video online in which he said, Allah is great and the most wonderful planner. He is the best of planners. So therefore, he was apparently counting on Allah's help to carry out jihad in Syria and blow up the Los Angeles subway system because Allah is the best of planners. And he told an FBI informant last month, the FBI informant, he's not realized he was talking to somebody who was going to turn him in. My designs have me staying there in Syria and being on every news station in the world. I'm going to be a commander, and I'm going to be on the front of every single newspaper in the country. Like, I want my face on FBI's top 12 most wanted because that means I'm doing something right. And he intended to appear in a video that was going to be produced on behalf of the group, but he was going to do it without the head covering to mask his identity. He said, I wanted to be, quote, the one white devil that leaves their face wide open to the uh, camera. And then it goes on to talk about his plans to target the L.A. subway system on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. Now listen to this. Here's the part that, that I think it's at the very end of the piece, so you might tend to overlook the significance. Listen to this. Uh, two of the last three paragraphs. Other classmates said he was quiet and liked to play chess. Fellow student Jonathan Admasu said he was a newly converted Muslim, but he never really pushed it on anybody. He never said anything. He was just normal. So notice the words that were used to describe this guy that if he could have gotten away with it, would have blown up the Los Angeles subway system in the name of Allah. He was quiet. He liked to play chess. He was just normal. He never pushed his Islamic faith on anybody. So in other words, this paints him as somebody who is entirely and utterly harmless. And that's the point. There is no way to identify the Muslims we have to worry about and distinguish them, separate them out from the ones that we don't. I think out of an abundance of caution, we just simply have to say no more Muslims in the National Guard, no more Muslims in the United States military. Now, speaking of another difference between uh, Islam and Judaism, Christianity, the Judeo-Christian tradition. This is clip number 19. This is Benjamin Netanyahu. Remember, Kerry's out there saying that uh, uh, Israel's got to recognize a Palestinian state for them to insist that the Palestinians recognize the Jewish state. That's too much. That's too far. We can't support that, uh, which is, of course, absolutely intolerable for the Jew. It's never They're never going to do that. So Kerry basically throwing the Israelis overboard. And here's what Netanyahu says in drawing a distinction between the Muslims in his part of the world and the Jews in his part of the world. Let's listen. Israel is humane. Israel is compassionate. Israel is a force for good. And he's right, the Israelis will provide medical treatment to Pakistani, I mean to Palestinians been wounded trying to blow up Israelis. They'll treat them in their hospitals.
That border that runs 100 yards east of that field hospital is the dividing line between decency and depravity, between compassion and cruelty. On the one side stands Israel, animated by the values we cherish, values that move us to treat sick Palestinians, thousands of them, from Gaza. They come to our hospitals, we treat them despite the fact that terrorists from Gaza hurl thousands of rockets at our cities. It's those same values that inspire Israeli medics and rescuers to rush to the victims of natural disasters across the world, to Haiti, to Turkey, to Japan, the Philippines, to many other stricken lands. Now, on the other side of that moral divide, steeped in blood and savagery, stand the forces of terror, Iran, Assad, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, and many others. Did you ever hear about Syria sending a field hospital anywhere? Did you ever hear about Iran sending a humanitarian delegation overseas? No? You missed that memo? <laughs> you know why? You know why you haven't heard anything about that? Because the only thing that Iran sends abroad terrorists and missiles to murder, maim, and menace the innocent. So Netanyahu drawing a strong distinction between Judaism, its humanitarianism, its compassion, and Islam. And here's, a di here's an example of the difference right here in the United States, peace on eaglerising.com. Uh, an evil Muslim man has likely murdered his daughter for the crime of homosexuality. This is here in America. His daughter was a lesbian. Her lifestyle had dishonored his family, so this was an honor killing in the name of Allah, in the name of Islam. Police believe that 46-year-old James Larry Cosby murdered his daughter, Brittany, and her girlfriend, Crystal Jackson, before dumping their bodies like garbage. A spokesman for the family, Quanell X, says that he found writings about homosexuality in Cosby's Quran. In Islam, homosexuality is forbidden. It is forbidden. And he says, I learned today that Larry, again, that's not a Muslim name, was a practicing Muslim. Now, in direct contrast, stand the actions of the family of the other murdered girl, Crystal Jackson, her father, a Christian minister. He and his family have already voiced forgiveness for their daughter's killer. Back in two. We're dealing with a rare and, in fact, unprecedented set of meteorological circumstances. People can fill in the blanks as they will. Sandy is potentially a 